If you remember last week, we ended with the poem, The Olive Tree by Sabine Bering Gold. And we're just going to quickly recap that before we, we got on. Leading up to that poem, obviously, was this idea of you don't actually know what you want. You see, the problem is that everyone believes, wholeheartedly believes that they know exactly what they want. But no sooner we find that you attain that particular object of your desire, that person, that ideal, that goal that you're striving for. And it's only a matter of time before the mind has pitched up something else. Now, this is the nature of the mind. The mind's very nature is insatiable. In fact, the desires within the mind are insatiable. And this is a problem. Because if we are to indiscriminately continue contacting our desires, what happens is we become miserable. Because there's no way you can fulfill all the desires you have. It's impossible. Even if you had all the time, resources, funding everything available to you you look at these uh, multi-billionaires excessive amounts of desires even with all that wealth they keep on accumulating why remember we talked about this void this feeling of emptiness so we don't know really what we want we think we do convinced you know craig if i get that particular thing or if i reach this particular goal then I'm set. I don't have to worry after that. And he gives this example of these two hermits. They both thought noble, innocuous desire. What did they require? Just a bit of uh, oil. They wanted to, uh, for their prayers, actually. Just for their prayers, they wanted a bit of oil. Doesn't seem like a bad desire. So they both went about planting olive seed. You need olive seed to get olive trees, to get olive oil. And uh, we see the two different scenarios play out. The one hermit prays and prays and prays. And he prays for the things that the tree needs, actually. And what happens is tree ends up dying. And then the other hermit, what did he do? Well, he planted the seed as well, put it in the ground. It's funny, he says there, it's uh, in its uh, rocky cell. A rocky means hardly any soil, nothing can grow. Anyway, he puts it there and he does whatever he has to do. And there's the tree. He says, uh, uh, God knew what it needed better than a man like me, essentially. So what is this essentially saying to us? See, you may take away from this. Oh, that's great. I'll just leave it all to the divine hand. Fantastic. I really like this philosophy. I uh, just uh, can kick back. Let God take care of it. It's not saying that. It's not saying, see, that hermit that got the olives, it's not that he didn't do anything. He obviously watered and, you know, tended to the sapling, eventually resulting in the tree. So he performed his obligations in this context. And this is what the poem is actually driving home this point. So in life, everybody has obligations to fulfill, whether it's, uh, obligations to your parents you may be a mother at home you have certain obligations you may be a person working in a business obligations family obligations friendship obligations obligations to yourself obligations to your health obligation the list goes on so we're not saying Vedanta is not saying you irk from these obligations in life you must perform your duties and obligations and then you leave it. You can only do so much. You can only do what you can do, essentially. As long as you are fulfilling your obligations, that's it. That's enough. The problem comes in is when we can't fulfill these obligations. And because of that deficit, oh, I, can't, I can't get this or I can't achieve this, we start praying. Not P-R-A-Y, P-R-E-Y, praying. Who are we praying on? We're praying on God, asking for favors. 
This is actually not prayer. Prayer is not asking God for favor. You're not in entering some business deal with God. No, God, you know, I pr promise I'll be very good. It's not, you're not a seven-year-old uh, uh, writing to Santa Claus. You know, I'll be a good boy. Bring me some presents. This is a, it's a mockery. This is what prayer has become. It's called in the book as licensed beggary. You're, be you're begging, essentially. If, uh, I promise. I'll go to church, I'll go to the temple, I'll go to the mosque. Every day this week, you just grant me this. So where there's that deficit in the performance of our obligations in our duties, be they mundane or spiritual, that deficit we try to make up in prayer, in favors, in asking. Not understanding how the laws function. So... Of course, there are many uh, you can derive, and I'm sure many of you that read over the, the poem, there's more to it than just obviously the point we're trying to highlight. Another big topic that comes up in the, is this idea of surrender. And what you have to appreciate, surrender is devotion, is worship, essentially. You're surrendering to areas of your ignorance. I don't know, like the hermit. He surrenders. He says, um, he who made knew what it needed better than a man like me. He who made knew what it needed better than a man like me. In other words, he's surrendering. I don't know how to grow this tree. The divine nature, it knows. I surrender to that. Areas of ignorance. You must learn to surrender to your areas of ignorance. This is devotion this essentially sums up what devotion is so you are surrendering to those things you don't know see look and laugh how did you get here how long are you going to be here when are you going what are you doing here did the chicken come first did the egg come first where did it all start who is maintain see there's so many things in life we don't know so many things. I'm just rattling off a few. Must surrender. Even when you get ill, you don't know medicine. You take yourself to a doctor. You surrender to his ex or her expertise. You don't know architecture. You want to build a house. You surrender to that person's expertise. No, no, no. Sorry. I know it looks nice, but unfortunately, we can't do that. It lacks support. It lacks um, uh, integrity. That won't be possible. Ah, there's actually uh, interesting documented cases where, you know, people wanted a, a bit a better view, and ended up knocking down a wall. Whole building came down. The supporting wall didn't consult. They believe they knew. So this is the message that we get from the poem. Of course, there's many more in there, uh, but this is the main the, the two main messages. We don't know what we want, so. If we learn this truth, okay, I, I think I do, but maybe I don't. Maybe I don't know what it is. Learn to surrender in life. Just learn to the, surrender to those areas. That's devotion. Devotion is an integral aspect of any spiritual discipline. In fact, they're called karma, bhakti, and jnana. These are just Sanskrit terms. All it means is action, devotion, knowledge. Those are the three spiritual disciplines. Why three? Because you've only got three material equipments, a body, a mind, and an intellect. So for the body, we prescribe karma yoga. For the mind, bhakti yoga or devotion. And this is this aspect of surrender we're talking about. And for the intellect, we prescribe knowledge. Knowledge on the higher truth of life. What is that reality that pervades everything? Okay, so we're going to get on to the last two aspects in this chapter. Remember, we're, we're on the chapter that's dealing with the mind wreaks havoc. And the last two aspects that we're going to be looking at are these two motivations and attachment. 
Again, just to put you in the picture, we're looking at the mind, the various aspects of the mind. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list of all the, the mind is comprised of or all the various aspects of the mind. They're just the main aspects of the mind that we need to become aware of in order to manage them. That's it. Uh, we're not trying to thwart them. We're not trying to suppress them. Uh, we are just being aware that the mind behaves in a particular way. And it's in our interest to understand this. If we want to gain control over the mind, if we want the ability to manage our mind, manage our desires, stop the mind from rambling, prevent these likes and dislikes from determining our course in life, it's best we know about them. So the two motivations, again, reading from the book, desires manifest as two powerful motivations in life acquisition and enjoyment you want to acquire whatever you desire from the world and after acquiring you long to enjoy what you have acquired propelled by these two motivations every human being craves to acquire and enjoy more and more in the world he consumes his entire life chasing images of happiness None has found true happiness in mere acquisition or enjoyment. Yet the chase never ends. People are ultimately exhausted with their futile efforts and become frustrated and unhappy. So two main motivations. This, these two motivations are driving all our actions. Acquisition, we want to acquire an enjoyment. Having acquired the things from the world, we want to then enjoy them. We want to acquire a partner and enjoy their company. We want to acquire a house and enjoy living in it. We want to acquire a bicycle and enjoy riding it. There's no end to this acquisition and enjoyment and again there's no limit either because again the mind's very nature is that it is insatiable remember he's talking in the context here the author is talking in the context of desires remember the mind the mind's desires are insatiable it's like fire for those of you who have ever built a fire or no fires you will understand that no matter how many logs or how much wood you throw into the fire, the fire will continue consuming it. At no point will the fire say, you know what? I've got enough coals here. There's enough ash below. I think we can call it a knot. No fire says that. It will continue to consume because this is its nature. Similarly with the mind, the mind is insatiable if left ungoverned. Remember, we don't want to create the wrong impression here that the mind is this terrible, terrible thing. You know, uh, we got to get rid of this mind. It's, it's going to destroy us. No, it is nothing but an ungoverned mind that is creating havoc in our lives. So one of the ways it does this one of the ways in which this manifests is through acquiring. The mind wants more and more and more and more and more. There's no satiation in acquisition. You can go on acquiring, acquiring. You will never be satiated. The wealthiest man in the world. I don't know who it is now. You know, his stocks are coming up and down so fast, nobody ever knows. I think it's either Jeff or Elon, one of the two. Anyway, Bill is probably up there. Have they stopped acquiring more wealth? You do look at their bank balance. It's unfathomable. The amount of money that these people have generated. Personal wealth. Have they stopped at that and said, that's it, I've got more than what I need 
for generations. I could probably, uh, Elon Musk said he could solve world poverty with all his wealth. Come with a plan, I'll solve world poverty. Not one of those guys has actually stopped. Richest. You look at um, Miss World. If you were to uh, take Miss World aside, some aspect she would want to improve. Uh, you know, this blemish or I wish my eyebrows or uh, sorry, eyelashes were a bit longer. Hair was a bit darker. Something, a little bit more beauty they want. So this keeps going on and on and on. There's an interesting um, episode, or there's actually an interesting article. It was available for free up until, I think, recently. It's in the Daily Telegraph, I think. I think now you've got to pay for the article. But the article is called Wealth Fatigue Syndrome. And it actually deals with these super rich people that acquire and acquire and acquire. And the, the title of the, the article is, are you, are you bored? Um, are you miserable? You must be rich. It's called wealth fatigue syndrome. It highlights this idea perfectly. What it's saying is these super wealthy people See, they've done everything. They've experienced everything. There's nothing left for them to enjoy, actually. The chase goes on. They want the bigger yachts, private planes, private jet. It goes on and on and on. And they get to a point where they, they become bored. Because whatever they acquire is not fulfilling their uh, ability to be happy. Remember, we're all looking for happiness at the end of the day. This is not the way to go about it. See, it says here in the last point, you'll notice your life is exciting only when you don't have it. See, there's something you want, right? There's that uh, feeling inside. I got to get that. I got it. Whatever it is, I got to get that. Is it an excitement? Pursue it. Whether it's a goal, an ambition, a particular thing, somebody, perhaps it could even be. There's excitement in the pursuit, in the chase of that particular thing. Once you gain that thing, it's over. You have it. Now what? Ah. You're happy for five minutes. Then something needs to fill in and take that place. Otherwise, you, uh, there's no excitement in your life. So this is the trap that we tend to fall into. And so we go. Day in, day out. Acquiring, acquiring, acquiring. Just to fill that void. Just to feel that sense of satisfaction. You can never gain it from the world. And yet everyone believes and everyone goes to the world in order to try and gain that happiness from it. From the very beginning of life, the mind has a tendency to acquire the wealth of the world. Yet it cannot qualify or quantify what it wants. Even in the present, when the mind acquires the object of its desire, it forthwith pitches up something else. This thirst for acquisition goes on and on. So again, as, as I was mentioning earlier, these desires, these impulses, these uh, mm, particular things that we want to acquire, it's not uh, right or wrong per se. No, 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 you shouldn't get that or you shouldn't go for that. That's not the right thing to do. We're not saying that at all. But what we are saying is that this is the motivation that drives our actions. We're motivated into action. See, we're all acting, right? Everybody in the Zoom room. In fact, everybody in the world is acting. What drives their actions? You see, come back. 
We're talking about the mind here. Now, if you are driven by the mind, I'm going to take you all the way back to that diabetic example. Diabetic likes sweets. He is driven by the mind. He takes the sweets. He suffers the consequences, right? Remember that. Actions are driven by the intellect, the mind, or combination of both. So in the case of the mind's driven actions, these are the motivations of the mind. Acquisition. Uncontrolled desires. This is the mind, ungoverned. You want to acquire and acquire and acquire. Remember, the mind has no dimension or direction. In the sense, it can pitch up anything. You see, this is a problem. You see, in fact, all the problems that we see in the world today is because of nothing other than an ungoverned mind. Fundamentally, you may say, well, how can you say uh, climate change? Uh, what's it? Uh, uh, vaccines? Mandates? Uh, all the, I'm just giving contemporary issues at the moment. If you break it down, it all stems from an ungoverned mind. A person, take uh, some of the greatest uh, tragedies in history. Uh, a person has uh, genocides, millions of people killed in wars, whatever. Mind. Mind pitched up a thought. What happens if I could rule the continent or this country? Then what happens if I could rule the continent? What happens if I could rule the world? Insatiable desire for power. You see, if your intellect's in checks, stupid idea. Why are you thinking? Why do you want to rule the world? Everybody uh, can, you know, pick everyone up and people can govern themselves, you know. So what you have to appreciate is in these motivations, there's no satiation. There's no limit. You will go on acquiring, acquiring, enjoying temporarily. And where do you get up, end up back? Back to acquiring. And then you acquire and then you enjoy. And then you go back to acquiring and enjoying. Acquiring, enjoying. The chase never ends. It's like this. I say, uh, catch your shadow. You catch your shadow, right? And you run around and around and around. You run all day trying to catch your shadow. Will you ever catch a shadow? You'll never catch it. It always eludes you. It always eludes you. As you get near it, off it goes. As the sun sets, the further away it goes, actually. This is quite interesting. You'll never catch it. So how do you catch a shadow? You just put your hand like that. You caught yourself. Or caught your shadow. <laughs> what I'm saying is, you start governing the mind. You start getting the mind in check. All of a sudden, these acquisition and enjoyment stop bothering you. They're bothering you now because if you don't get what you are looking to get, you get dejected, you get disappointed, you get fed up. Oh, what is this life? You know, some people they commit uh, atrocities just to get the things they want. They'll break the law, they'll cross boundaries, barriers simply because the mind demands it. So we need to be aware of these two aspects, this acquisition and enjoyment. Human beings face a real problem in their mind's insatiable desire to acquire, to aggrandize, and the consequent agitation and frustration. The thirst can never be quenched by sheer acquisition of whatever the mind demands. Neither can the problem be solved by suppressing the desire for acquisition. In fact, there is no taboo to acquisition. You are advised only to control, regulate the mind's indiscriminate craving for acquisition. See, as we said, nothing wrong with acquiring. You, may, you want a house, yeah, a shelter, you want a place to live, a place to bring up your family, a place where you can feel, feel safe, secure. There's nothing wrong with that. 
So we're not against acquiring. Vedanta doesn't say, no, I only have so much. Anything beyond that is excess, is indulgence. Nowhere in the philosophy does it say that. All it says is there shouldn't be this craving, constant craving. Get what you, figure out what you need in life, what kind of quality of life you want. Go out, get that stuff. All the You see, figure out means applying the intellect. Applying the intellect to etch out a plan for your life. Etch out a direction. Remember, the mind's got no direction. The intellect needs to participate in order to set a direction in your life. It's not acquisition that's the problem. See, the other group of people, they'll say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to have anything. Uh, I don't want that. I don't want that. I don't want it. They, what happened? They're just suppressing their desires. They, they try and abstain. They believe that through abstinence, they will uh, progress. And when I say progress, develop. But it's also not true. So if it's not through abstinence, by you saying no to the mind all the time, no, 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 not that, not that and it's not through indulgence, then where's the enjoyment actually? See, we talk about acquisition and enjoyment. How do you enjoy life? How do you go through life and continually enjoying yourself? Regulation, moderation, controlling the mind. See, you could, uh, uh, simple example, right? Particular type of food you enjoy eating, ice cream, let's say. Now, you go all out and you eat ice cream every day, two helpings a day. What happens? Eventually, you're sick of it. Uh, I used to like ice cream, but now nah, I don't like ice cream. Actually, I'll give this example because it happened to me. And when we were kids, we had ice cream every, even in winter, ice cream every day. If there was an ice cream in the freezer, we'd put out, I remember my poor father, uh, we must have been Rakshasas. Rakshasas is demons, demon children. We made my poor father go out at some ridiculous hour to get us ice cream because the ice cream had ran out. That much of a... Uh, infatuation we had for ice cream right uh, ice cream ice cream i couldn't do without ice cream then uh thank goodness uh changed my diet which you know uh there was no that time when i changed there was no vegan ice cream so for 10 years or whatever it was i had no access to ice cream and i needed that uh, uh break to actually enjoy it again and this is the risky run See, if you're contacting, 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 you lose enjoyment. It's called neutralization. You get neutralized to that thing. You actually don't enjoy it anymore. So you need a break from it to start enjoying it. Now, if you want to continue enjoying something throughout your life, whatever that thing is, it's in your interest to regulate that control. It happens in the context of partnership too. You see these uh, relationships developing. You, you can see it. It's too obvious. They don't see it. That's the problem. Everyone else can see it. Uh, two people, they smother each other. They want to spend every waking moment together and sleeping moment together. See, even uh, partners, couples, married couples at the academy, separate beds. It is the most intelligent uh, way to function. Separate beds. There's a reason for it. You may say, terrible, sounds terrible. In fact, I would re recommend even one step further, separate rooms. Even better, separate houses. <laughs> no, don't get lost. The point is, is that regulation. You go on uh, enjoying each other's company for the rest of your days. So, of course, this, uh, the second motivation is the desire to enjoy what has been acquired. Here again, there is no objection to enjoyment. You are not to refrain from enjoying what the world offers you, but to restrain, control your indulgence in them. So acquisition, nothing wrong. Just regulate, moderate. Enjoyment, nothing wrong. We don't uh, buy ice cream 
to give to the dog or buy a fine dark chocolate to give to the cat. The world is here for us to enjoy. Why not enjoy it, right? That enjoyment should not lead into indulgence. That's where the problem arises. See, you're enjoying something and you're feeling happy, you're feeling good. It makes you feel elated. Mm, this is great. So what do you do? You go back. You go back. You keep on going back to contact it to replicate that happiness that you experience, that joy that you derive. No sooner you know it, you are indulging in that particular enjoyment. Indulgence leads to loss of enjoyment. This is something nobody understands. They, most of the world believe the more you contact something, the more enjoyment there is. Just the opposite. The more you regulate, the more you're able to enjoy. Simple, simple truth. The unrestricted craving for enjoyment agitates the mind and ruins your peace. You suffer. Also, you enjoy objects or beings only when you exercise voluntary regulation and moderation. If, however, you do not exercise control and plunge into indiscreet indulgence and sensual enjoyment, you lose the charm of it. You cannot enjoy it anymore. Unrestricted indulgence kills the enjoyment that you seek. So again, we often see this in the more affluent people because these are the people, see, the people that can't afford it, they, uh, not that they don't have that desire to enjoy. It's something different. That uh, desire there is there because they, they want it. That's why you often find, they often blame the impoverished for being, uh, uh, getting into crime. Oh, why is crime and uh, all these uh, impoverished areas? For this reason, you work it out. The desire is there. They can't fulfill it. There's no wealth to fulfill that desire. So they go out and break the boundaries. They break the law in order to get the objects of desire. Something That's something slightly separate. I'm just explaining it. The affluent, however, because they can afford it, what do they do? They keep on indulging in that. Bigger problem. You lose enjoyment. There's a story. The Swami actually went to Europe and there was this family he met and there was this young, young boy, 17, 18. He tells this story. Swamiji tells the story of this boy on his birthday. It must have been his 18th birthday. He was there. And uh, the, mother, the mother or the father gave him the birthday present. The birthday present was a set of keys. Keys to a brand new Ferrari. You know what the boy's reaction was? I'll see it in the morning. Any one of you get a Ferrari, the first thing you'll do is jump out your seat and jump in and go for a drive. You know, I would imagine. If you can't relate to that, uh, think of something, something that you would enjoy doing. Another is the same family. Said, what are you going to do for your birthday? Why don't you take your friends in the private jet and go to the villa in the Alps? They had a house there. Take uh, your friends skiing. How boring, mom. How boring. 17, 18. 18 years old. Can you imagine? Ferrari, whatever. Holiday in the Alps skiing with all your friends on a private check. Boring. This is why you see, especially in the affluent, young, very young, depression, suicide. There's no enjoyment anymore in life. You've done everything. You've got everything. What more is there? You become depressed. And this is exactly what happens when you continue indulging. So again, the one way to maintain this enjoyment is by regulating and moderating your contact. In truth, there is no joy content in the objects and beings of the world. 
but it is extremely difficult, nay, impossible to convince the lay person that the world cannot pro provide the enjoyment he seeks from it. We we're just discussing this uh, last night. I uh, conduct a weekly class in the Vedanta Treatise, which is another book authored by Swami A. Padmasavati. We go in a lot more detail. We're just moving through this quickly. It's just an introductory course. Uh, for those of you who are interested, you can take up the study further. We'll provide a couple options at the end of this course. But we were discussing this exact um, concept that the world cannot provide you happiness. Impossible. And the, re the way that we prove that is through a cigarette, believe it or not. Cigarette. A man picks up a cigarette, smokes. He gets immense pleasure from it. The person sitting next to him detests it. Please put that thing away. Pleasure to one, pain to another. A man is going into the lawyer's office to divorce his wife. Another man downstairs, eagerly waiting to marry her. A cigarette being the same, produces pleasure to one, pain to another. Woman being the same, produces pleasure to one, pain to another. Therefore, we conclude that it cannot be in the objects and beings of the world. In fact, I put it to the class last night. Give me one thing which everybody in the world wants and loves and must have. Nobody could. There wasn't any one thing, to put it that way. So all that proves is that there's no joy content in the object or being itself, but how we relate to it. But everyone is convinced that it's in the world. It's that particular thing. If I get that, then I will be happy. That perpetuates the madness. If I get that, I'll be happy. If I get that, the cycle goes on and on and on. Simple analogy. Simple analogy. You see, because otherwise you say, yeah, you keep your philosophy. I get great enjoyment from my children. I get a great enjoyment from the activities I engage in. From my work, I gain enjoyment. Impossible to convince you any, uh, to convince you otherwise. Because you're experiencing that. See, all the joys you get from the world, no doubt there is an, a, a quantum of enjoyment. But what you have to appreciate is that quantum is fleeting. It lasts for a time and then it's gone. You're playing with your children, you're having so much fun and then you had enough. You know, they start playing up or they want to do something different. They want to go there. They start giving you a hard time. Okay, okay, go to your rooms. I had enough now. Well, whatever the case. So, but it's very difficult to convince you that there's no joy in the world. So they use this moon analogy. See, there's this family, right? Sitting, having a picnic and it's a full moon. A full moon, you can see everything. And you go up to them. These are uneducated people. You say to them, oh, are you enjoying yourself? Yes, yes, it's a lovely evening. Um, I was just thinking, can I ask you a question? Yes, yes, please, sure. I say, is there light in the moon? And they look around and they look at each other. This is a crazy guy. Of course there's light in the moon, man. Look, can't you see it? Can't you see the light coming from the moon, shining on us? We are enjoying, we are experiencing it. What, are you, what kind of silly question is that? Yes, there's light in the moon. Of course, we all educated, yeah, at least educated enough to turn our computer and listen to this. But we, I believe, all appreciate that, of course, there's no light in the moon. The moon is a rock. No light, no light bulb in there. Someone is going and fixing the light, making sure the moon's shining every night. No, no light in the moon. No matter how much you try and convince this family, you can't. Because they're experiencing that enjoyment. They're experiencing that light. Similarly with the world. It's very difficult to convince anyone because they're going through that experience. They're gaining some pleasure and joy from the world. So this is all I can offer you. Think of that moon analogy. When you go and uh, so-called getting some kicks, temporary kicks from the world. Think about the moon analogy. In other words, what I'm saying is when you're educated on these higher values, then you'll appreciate that everything that the world can offer you in terms of your overall sense of subjective well-being is limited and fleeting. 
Arthur Schopenhauer, famous German philosopher, says, it is difficult to find happiness within oneself. It means it's not easy. But it is impossible to find anywhere else. In other words, you can't find it anywhere else but within, within yourself. So what is this happiness within? So when the mind is calm, you even say, how are you feeling? No, completely calm, I'm chilled, I'm just at peace, I'm content, I'm happy. When does that happen? When the mind is calm. When is the mind not calm? The mind is not calm when it is pursuing these desires. It's agitated because there's something that needs fulfilling. I must go and get this. At the end of the day, you've done all that you can do. You're sitting down, you've eaten your meal, nothing left to do. 100% content. All that's left to do is actually go to sleep. There's two ways to calm the mind. One is to go and fulfill all those desires, right? Then the agitation stops. The problem with that is that in fulfilling the desires, we've already mentioned this, in fulfilling the desires, you are generating more desires and more desires. So there are more unfulfilled desires. More unfulfilled desires mean more agitation. So you're actually working against yourself. The other way to calm the mind is through knowledge, through understanding, through elimination of desires or pacifying and controlling the desires. So if you're able to gain control over the mind, then you become happy. You gain that peace. The masses lack the wisdom to accept the truth that there is no joy content in the world. Their argument is similar. They can perceive the joy in the sense objects and argue that they gain enjoyment out of them. Hence, they can never accept there is no joy in the external world. You may likewise hold on to your views, but just ponder over the moonlight example. This is referring to that example again. Okay, and that brings us to the final aspect that we're going to discuss, which is attachment. This aspect of the mind that we need to look into. Are there any um, questions up to this point? Everyone okay for us to continue? Again, if there are questions at the end, I'd be more than happy to, to take them up. Um, if not, we can continue with the presentation. Yes, Asanda. Hello, everybody. Craig, please repeat the quote by Arthur Schwan Schwan, the oh, yes. guy, please. I'll, I'll, put it up. I'll put it up for you, actually. I'll do you one better. Thank you. It's difficult to find happiness within oneself, but it is impossible to find anywhere else. You got it? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. All right, so attachment. So attachment arises, of course, again, all these problems associated with the mind. The mind wreaks havoc. The mind wreaks havoc. When does the mind wreak havoc? When it is ungoverned. So when there's no intellect, governing the mind, we have these problems. The mind is left to its own devices. I gave that example right in the beginning. I don't know if you remember with the adult and the child. Young child, put him in a, a compromising situation. In other words, in a kitchen full of dangerous objects, there's a potential to hurt himself, destroy, uh, harm, not just himself, the surroundings. Put an adult in the room and it's a different story. Same with the intellect. If there's no Intellect present, the mind left uncontrolled can create a lot of problems for you, for you, your own self. Now, with particular reference to what we're going to be studying next, we're looking at this aspect called attachment. Now, you probably have some ideas and you hear this word attachment and you start, the mind starts going, ah, oh, I donh, no, attachment, attachment, and it's good attachment, there's bad attachment. Uh, Put all your ideas aside for now. Just put them one side. 
We're going to explain this. Try, try put them aside at least, okay? Um, because this really is an important subject and it's important that you understand what we're saying here. The reason that there is so much suffering in the world is because of attachment. In fact, the book that follows this book is called The Holocaust of Attachment. If there is enough interest, I'd be more than happy to engage in the study of that book. Uh, we'll, we'll do a head count at the end and, and find out. But the whole book is about this attachment. And uh, the author says, the reason that the world is suffering because of attachment. And nobody understands what's going on. You go to the uh, World Health Organization, they don't understand. You go to uh, the so-called uh, thinkers of the world, they don't know what's going on. You and I, the Swamiji's tried, he's gone there. There's no thinkers there. No thinkers left to actually understand the magnitude of the problem. Everybody looking at everything, this change, that change, this endemic, that pen, what they, nobody understands the reason why this is happening. Simply attachment. See, nobody, people are in this position. People are suffering, really suffering. Uh, I speak to uh, my psychologist friends and they tell me they can't take any more patients. Not only that, their psychologist colleagues are suicidal, depressed, on pills. I know most of them can't sleep. It's a massive problem. Nobody understands what's going on. This is one place you can understand the magnitude of the problem and understand exactly what's going on. Attachment is a pernicious passion destroying the peace and harmony of the young and old. Attachment is actually a pollution of love. When love is vitiated by self-centeredness, selfishness, it turns into attachment. And when attachment is free from self-centered motives, it is love. Equation. There's the equation. Simple equation. Attachment minus selfishness equals love. Love plus selfishness equals attachment. Oliver Goldsmith, he says, and love is still an emptier sound. The modern fair ones jest on earth unseen or only found to warm the turtle's nest. First problem with attachment is that everybody believes love or everybody thinks that they are in love or I love this person or I love my pets or I love my children. That love is nothing but attachment. He says, yeah, on earth unseen, Oliver Goldsmith, this guy is uh, way before his time. In fact, he's a great, great thinker. He says, love, love on earth is unseen. It doesn't exist. You may say, oh, that's very harsh because I do. I love my children. I love my partner. See, the reason that people are confused, I'm not saying that you don't. Again, as I said before, put your ideas just aside for a second and just listen to what's being said here, being communicated. You're free to make your decisions at the end. You're free to examine and figure out what it is, where you be honest with yourself. See, the two are so related closely related this is why there's this confusion because both manifest in a similar way you say you love your children but you could also be attached to your children attachment and love there's this feeling of affection a fondness to them you want what's best for them in attachment and love it's the same so what is the essential difference by now you should know because that equation spells it out the difference between love and attachment lies in that self-centeredness. See, you love your partner. This is your claim. No, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking this generally. Everybody in the world says, no, no, I love my partner. You love your partner as long as your partner is catering to your demands, be they material, physical, emotional, intellectual. I've got countless examples of um partners splitting why materially they weren't able to cater to me anymore 
honestly, this is a reason. They got they lost their job, couldn't keep up the lifestyle I wanted. So we split. So whenever that demand, wherever it is, is not being uh, catered to, this is when you can slowly see the cracks of attachment coming in. Diksha, I'll address your question just now. So whenever there is this sense of hardness, sense of mindness, attachment is self-centered love. I love you if you do these things for me, if you are being this way. Hey, honey, uh, I'm going off uh, for a weekend uh, with my mate. Well, you didn't tell me. Perhaps I didn't. Yeah, we're just going off, you know, have a boy. We're going to have a enjoying. Where are you going? Oh, someone's organized something. Oh, really? Well, I don't think that's good enough. All of a sudden, that love, where does it go? Out the window. Why? Wow. Because her desires, demands, whatever they may be, maybe she had plans or maybe she said had some intentions for that weekend, are not being met. There's this conflict. That spells attachment. See, I think Shakespeare says, love is not love that alters when altercation finds. In other words, love is constant. Excuse me. Love is constant. It doesn't change. Your partner caters you, doesn't cater to you, is angry with you, uh, praises you. Your feeling towards them does not change. As soon as there is some fluctuation in that feeling, it means that there is, to that extent, an infiltration of your ego and egocentric demands placed on that particular relationship. So this love is when there is no selfish motive at all. Your only intention is to cater to the other person's demands. You only get into a relationship for both of your spiritual evolution. No other reason where you'd necessarily get into a relationship. Of course, uh, as we discussed, there's six reasons for marriage. But in the context of love, love is uh, free from selfishness. Now, where is the man or where is the woman that is free from selfishness? You'd be hard pressed to find one. In fact, uh, I found one in my whole life of searching one man. In fact, it just happened to be the man who authored this book, Free from Selfishness. I think he's been married for 60 years. Not only that, he's got 100, uh, 100 children, not his own. 100 children at the academy look after you. Perfect relationship with their, all of them. Perfect relation. No issue whatsoever. Because he's an embodiment of love. No selfish motive whatsoever. How best can I serve this person? That is true love. There we go. Love's not love, which alters when alteration finds. The mind thus binds itself to anything it contacts. The bondage produces sorrow and misery. It devastates the human race. To avoid this self-inflicted damage, you must develop and use your intellect to protect, preserve your love. You must ensure your love does not turn sour with self-centered motives. Love produces peace and harmony, whereas attachment causes distress and disharmony. When a person develops attachment to another or an object, he is bound to go through pain and suffering. It does not end there. He, become, he becomes estranged to that person, to that object of attachment. Sooner or later, he would lose the relationship. The loved one would desert him, even perish, and leave the lover shattered and distressed. It is the law of nature. Okay, so just to get back to Diksha's question. 
Is attachment to continual improvement also bad? For example, if you desired a house and bought one and then found that it had a serious damp or mold issue, would the desire to buy another one also be an unspiritual desire? If you had no desire, you might stay in an unhealthy situation. Or should you just accept the situation and apply to Tiksha? To Tiksha, for those who don't know, is a Sanskrit term and it means putting up with difficulties uh, with pleasure. In other words, uh, your mother-in-law, father-in-law come around to visit for a week and uh, you say to your wife, we'll go and stay on the couch for the week in the lounge. and Give them the, the bedroom. But you don't do it begrudgingly. Oh, come again, I'm going to have to sleep. You do it with a sense of joy, sense of pleasure. That's titiksha. Anyway, is attachment to continual improvement also bad? Listen to these words carefully. Any attachment is bad, is negative. Because attachment breeds sorrow. There cannot be healthy attachment. So attachment is a kind of fixation and not in a good way a fixation in the way the mind gets bound up caught up bonded to an object or a being you become attached in this case your example is a house you become attached to a house We're using your, this example you find this perfect house and you get you manage to acquire, you get attached to the house. Now, all of a sudden, something happens in that house. Damp. Oh, your heart is damp. Or wall is crumbling. Your heart is crumbling. Whatever then happens to that house happens to you. This is attachment in a nutshell. You get attached to the objects and beings of the world. Now, you may say, well, what's wrong with that, you know? See, you have no control over anything external to yourself. See, tomorrow that person that you're attached to could, might not be there. It's happened. All of a sudden, next day, that person is no longer. You've developed this attachment to them. What happens? Your heart is broken. I've seen people five, ten years still cannot get over the loss of a loved one. Five or 10 years. This is a long time. Strong, strong, strong sense of attachment. So you become mentally bound. This is attachment. Attachment is not something physical. Attachment is mental. It is a mental bondage. So any mental bondage makes you a slave. You become bound. And as I said, you have no control over the external environment. You may argue that to an extent. Yes, I can control the temperature in my car. Even that uh, gas may run out in the AC. Then anyway, it's your control. Gone. Everything. You have nothing, no control over anything. And you believe you have every control over everything. So... Now you got this attachment to this house, serious damp or mold issue. Would the desire to buy another house also be an unspiritual desire? See, what makes something spiritual and what makes something unspiritual? This is what we have to ask ourselves. What is a spiritual desire? What is an unspiritual desire? See, any desire that is uplifting the personality is spiritual. Any desire that is devolving the personality is unspiritual. And you'll say, well, that's kind of obvious. Any movement towards the spiritual core of your personality is being spiritual. Any movement away from that, in other words, towards the mundane terrestrial world, is unspiritual. So where are your thoughts? 
your thoughts are on your house, that has got nothing to do with spirituality. But it's not to say if you want a house, you're unspiritual. Right? See, you may genu genuinely need a house. Why? Well, I need a house to, you know, I've got certain obligations. My family need a place to stay. I need a place to stay. I want to pursue the subject. So I need somewhere to be able to do that somewhere calm and quiet and nice where I can sit with my books and study and listen to these lectures. Therefore, I want some place to be able to do that. Is that unspiritual? No, because that desire is projecting you, uplifting you to a higher state of functioning, higher state of being. So we all need to set a direction. Where is it we want to go? Okay, we want to improve ourselves. Self-development is a great ideal to entertain. In fact, it's one of the best ideals you could set for yourself. Self-improvement, self-development, spiritual evolution, all essentially mean the same thing. So anything that, any desire that aligns to that particular ideal or goal, you would then call that spiritual. It's taking you up. Anything that interferes with that takes you away from the pursuit of that ideal is negative, is unspiritual. Now, what is spirituality? A spirituality is nothing but the reduction of the ego and egocentric demands. So we can uh, spend our lives just moving from house to house to house to house. No, this house is no good. Then that house has got this problem. Then that house has got no... All attention is on the house. Mundane, terrestrial. The other way to look at it, yeah, I need a house for my own survival, sustenance, uh, peace of mind. It's okay, get a house. If you had no desire, you might stay in an unhealthy situation. No desire for what? We, we're not talking about no desire. We're talking here about tamas, lethargy, indolence, uh, laziness. Ah, who cares? Dampen the walls. I'll just live with it. That's not titiksha. That's laziness, tamath, lethargy. That is unspiritual. Sattva, that uh, mental temperament of purity, of calmness, of collectiveness, of activity. That is uh, spiritual. So it's not that you just need to passively accept situations. You may feel that the damp is a problem. It's going to affect my health. Best I do something about that. It doesn't mean you need to shift houses. Just sort the damp out. It's not a big issue. There's companies that uh, can look into it. So is attachment to continual improvement also bad? Yes. Because then you get attached to results. If you're always thinking about results, your mind is not in the present. You'll never achieve that. So you can get attached to a future self. You see, you can project a future self. A future self being a, that improved version of your current status. You can project that. There's nothing wrong. That's setting an intention. That's setting a direction. That's setting a goal to achieve something. But if you're constantly thinking about it, that, mean, that means attachment. Attachment is this stream of thoughts flowing constantly from you to the object or being or ideal or goal. Constantly flowing. You set up an expectation. You set up a mental bondage. See, imagine you're sitting in your room right now, wherever you're sitting. And everything around you, imagine you tie a string to everything around you in that room. Ah, I've got a nice TV. Ah, I've got a nice computer. I've got a nice this. I like all the things and my bed is so comfortable putting strings. Now get up and leave the room. What happens? All that stuff comes with you. This is exactly how attachment functions at the mental level. You're getting attached to the partner, to the children, to your job, to your wealth, to your name, to your fame, to your religion. Anything you want to do, you got to drag this lot with you. Mental bondage. Sarah, Diksha, are you okay? Okay. Excellent. Sarah. 
Yeah, hi, Craig. Uh, Craig, I had a question about something you mentioned in the beginning of class. You said when there is a, a deficit in the performance of our obligations, then we try to make up for it by praying, as in P-R-E-Y-I-N-G, mm. on God asking for favors. Mm. Uh, Craig, could you give an example of that? Like, um, what does it look like when, what kind of deficit in the performance of our obligations? So, for instance, you have a, an obligation, right, to uh, look into the material needs of, I'll give you an example for a family, right? You're the breadwinner in the house and you have uh, codependence and they are looking to you for shelter, for food, for clothing, for education, all of that. Yeah, being a parent, you've taken this on as an obligation, right? So you've set a certain standard by which you want to live your life. And all of a sudden, you find that that starts getting away from you, you know, the, the, this lifestyle you want to lead and what you want to provide your kids is, is not being fulfilled by your current job, let's say. Your uh, desires have spiraled a little bit out of control. You want to give them nothing wrong with it. You want to give them more than what you cap you, you're currently capable of. So you have this obligation, right, to fulfill to, towards your family. But you're finding that you can't fulfill that obligation, right? So there's a, a deficit. There is a, a bit missing, whatever. It could be uh, you're short $2,000 a month. Oh, if I just had that $2,000 extra, then my family would be looked after. I'd be looked, I get all the things, the nice things I want. They get all the nice things I want. They want deficit, right? So what do you do to make up for that deficit? You start praying. Oh, God, please, can you grant me a better paying job? Please, can you uh, let my husband get a raise? Please, can you uh, ask the school to drop the fees? Please, this, please, that, please, that. All these favors you start asking to make up that deficit. And that deficit you've created for yourself anyway. See, where's the need for praying if you... If the deficit's not there, live within your means. So I'm just using this as an example to try and illustrate what I was meaning by that deficit. You okay with that? Yeah, yeah I got it. Thank you so much, Craig. Yeah. All right. Attach, you lose. Oh, did we cover this? Sorry. Yeah. When a person develops attachment to another or an object, he is bound to go through pain and suffering. It does not end there. I think we did this. He becomes estranged to that person to the object of attachment. Sooner or later, he would lose a relationship. The loved one would desert him, even perish, and leave the lover shattered and distressed. It is a law of nature. You'll find this in the book. There's three poems highlighted there can have a look at those poems they all illustrate this exactly you get attached to a person that person eventually leaves you or they perish this is the law of life you have to read those poems to appreciate this uh, it's a magnificent magnificent they're long poems uh, for those who have the poems book by swami a Sarathi, they they're in there but the poems are highlighted so you can go and have a look at those poems um, if it's not clear, just uh, drop me a, a message and I'll point you in the right direction. So study the exhaustive analysis of the devastating nature of the mind. It illustrates how your mind wreaks havoc, how your personality is destroyed by one or more of the mind's corrosive phases. Your likes and dislikes can drive you up to a precipice and bring about a fall. All your worries and anxieties drain your energy and leave you exhausted, miserable. All your mind's uncontrolled desires and attachments, acquisitions and enjoyments ruin you. Therefore, you must develop your intellect to play its vital role in controlling and directing your mind's activity. And that's what we will study next week, the vital role of the intellect.